recording in the cloud. Okay, give me one second, I'll be right back. Anyway, I think you should go now. John, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, I think I, yeah, I I am not a co-host yet. If, uh, You're not what? I'm not a co-host because I can't. Not a co-host. Let me check. Uh, yeah. Okay. You want to try it again? Oh, okay. All right. No right. Okay, um, Harry, we'll give it a few more minutes. I think we need to let a few more people join. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'll be uh, good. So probably start in another three, four minutes. Yeah. What I call a hard boy, it's on the limit, Mago Fool, you are telling the way. From Florence. It is the woman get an Florence, where are you located? Yep, good morning, Tobago. Okay. Uh, Andy, you want to let us know where you guys are today? I'm in Singapore. 
Uh, Harry, Singapore as well. Sanjay yes. is with us from Malaysia. I'm in the UK. It's okay. Welcome. Welcome, Abaje, and Tony Mack. Looks like you're joining. California, US. Welcome, Florence. That's where I live back in the US. Thank you. Welcome, Eileen. All right, Harry, if you wanted to start with the intro, we can go ahead. Okay, uh, let me just uh, start my video. Okay, everyone, I would just like to welcome you all to, um, on the NIDO side, actually, this is the very first uh, uh, session of this kind that we're uh, putting together, but we're doing it uh, in conjunction uh, uh, with, uh, the uh, Wakanda blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, meetup. So um, for us, uh, it's something that uh, Nido has actually uh, planned to uh, do a little bit more frequently to have sessions like this where people can learn uh, what's going on, you know, in the uh, not just in the technological space but in uh, other spheres of uh, human endeavor. Um, my name is Harry Birinengi, I will be the facilitator today. And um, the way we've planned the program is that, uh, first of all, there's going to be a few minutes uh, welcome address by the NIDO Singapore uh, president, uh, Mr. Moshud Olanio. I'm still trying to check if he has connected. But in his absence, I already have uh, the vice president uh, in, uh, Dr. O.J. Obaje. Um, so it's uh, going to give us a quick uh, welcome, and then we'll go straight to the presentation. Um, uh, but before then, I'll probably take like two minutes to uh, introduce um, our speaker today, and then we'll go to the presentation, after which uh, we'll go to the question and answer session, and then a quick vote of thanks. It suffices to mention here that uh, we know that this is a very interesting topic. And as a result, um, people will be really interested to know uh, more. And you have a lot of um, questions and clarifications. Uh, so um, the presenter has graciously um, volunteered a 30 minutes extension of um, our time to give us um, more explanation in case we have uh, more questions um, from the presentations. So I would just like to call on Dr. Baje to give us a quick uh, intro. Uh, sorry, a, uh, a quick welcome address before we start. Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm not sure um, if I'm on the video. Yes, um, we can see you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, we appreciate everybody's presence on this uh, on this program, and um, as we all know, there's a lot of transformation going on uh, uh, in the in the wake of this COVID nineteen. Uh, a lot of disruption, and we all uh, have been hearing blockchain and Bitcoin, Bitcoin, and all that. And this is an opportunity to have one of our own who has been. Um, in this area for quite some time uh, to explain to us about um, what we need to know and how we get, need to get ourselves prepared. And I hope that at the end of the day, um, every one of us would have learned um, 
enough to participate effectively in this new world. So I welcome everyone and um, thank you, uh, John, for giving us your time to make this presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for that uh, quick uh, uh, talk. It's uh, important that we just go straight to the point. Thank you so much, Dr. Baje. So I'd uh, just like to introduce um, our uh, presenter for tonight. Uh, oh, yeah. In the morning for some of us, we have people in uh, different places in the UK, Nigeria, Singapore, and uh, Malaysia, as we uh, already has mentioned. So um, it is important that um, I, yeah. Oh, hello. So it, it, yeah. So I just like to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. He is someone that is uh, been in this uh, uh, blockchain for quite some time. He has been for thirteen years plus. Uh, he's a serial technology and startup entrepreneur. Um, he started his career in the United States. Has lived in the United States for uh, pretty uh, long, and he has been in the financial services uh, with Accenture, which is a world-renowned um, uh, uh, company. He's worked with uh, Fortune 500 um, establishments and also several startup uh, companies, including the government, uh, the National University of Singapore, and uh, Japanese uh, manufacturing giant Toyota. So our presenter tonight does not need uh, so much uh, introduction. Uh, John Okoro, please uh, take the floor. Thank you. So we are going to go through relatively quickly. Uh, Sanjay, who is in there, will also be helping to moderate the chat. So if you have questions, I won't take them until the end so we can get through. Um, but you can, Sanjay might try to help field any question in the chat. And we'll take, as uh, was mentioned at the end, we'll take questions. Okay. So let me go in. If everybody can see my screen, I hope. Hey, we are recording. Happy birthday to Ghana, which was last week. We had an encore session. Uh, so happy birthday there to uh, Ghana for the uh, independence. And we view the kind of cryptocurrencies and the economic independence side for many African nations and diaspora. Okay, right? so you've already been introduced. This is Sanjay. You'll be helping us in the chat uh, and moderate the session. So we are going to go through an introduction on cryptocurrency. I want to go through the economics and some use cases, some different ways it's being used. We are not gonna talk about crypto and trading. If you're interested in that, take a look at the session from last week, the recording. Uh, we have a full session that was done by Sanjay and Kishi, some of our members as well on the trading. Uh, then we are gonna talk basically about regulate, regulation, some of the Africa use case, and then we'll close with QA as well. Okay, so the economics of blockchain. Let's uh, play this and hopefully you guys can hear and see it. When you want to buy something normally using your normal bank card, this is what happens. I give my card details to the shop. The shop asks the bank if I'm good for the money. The bank checks its records to see if I've got enough in my account. If I do, it lets the shop know. It updates its records to show the movement of money from my account to the shops. Oh, and it takes a bit of time for trouble. Now, if you wanted to remove the bank from that system, who else would you trust to keep those records and not alter them or, or cheat in any way? Well, I wouldn't trust you. I wouldn't trust you. In fact, I wouldn't trust any single person. I might trust everyone. The idea is you don't have a central record of transactions. Instead, you distribute many, many copies of this ledger around the world. Each owner of each copy records every transaction. So, to buy something using cryptocurrency, I give the shop my details. The shop asks all the bookkeepers if I'm good for the money. The bookkeepers all check their records to see if I have enough. If I do, they tell the shop and then all update their records 
to show the movement of money. So there's no way that a forged transaction can make it in. If I try to alter a ledger, it won't match all of the other copies. And it gets rejected. Oh, and one of them, at random, will be given a reward of some newly created cryptocurrency. This is how cryptocurrencies work. And remember, all of these bookkeepers, all of these ledgers, they're not actually people. They're computers. Lots of computers. Okay, so we can see a basic, it's kind of an alternate way that financial transactions move. Now, just in the chat box, how many of you remember or know what the dot-com boom, or how many of you are familiar with the dot-com boom? Happened in 1999 uh, time frame. So just type yes in the chat box if you know the dot-com boom or you've heard of it before, or no if you've never heard of it before. Okay, one person has. Yes, yes, great, yes. Okay, so the dot-com boom was when we had companies like Amazon and Facebook, um, we had you know Google and all these companies, and this basically started in Silicon Valley, right? Uh, you had things like maids.com, brooms.com, pets.com, a lot of companies that are not around anymore also. Okay? Now, there are some similarities to what we're seeing with blockchain and cryptocurrency today and some differences. The dot-com boom was pretty much only centered in the Silicon Valley in California in the US, California where I live most of my adult life. Uh, the blockchain and cryptocurrencies are global, right? So you have people who are in this space in Nigeria, you have people in this space from you know, Eastern Europe, you have people in this space from um, Asia here in Singapore. And the dot-com was primarily only venture capital investments where and a, a traditional accredited investors where blockchain and we had ICOs, now we have exchange offerings, is anybody can participate in blockchain uh, investments, right? So there is a difference in that way as well. We can see here, I didn't do the price chart today. I think it's about $56,000 for a Bitcoin. There's currently around 8,700, almost 8,800 different coins and tokens. I've shown you about the top 15 of them here. You probably heard of some of these before, things like Ethereum and Binance Coin and Tether. Right. These are all different altcoins or alt currencies on coins that are on blockchain. And these are public blockchains, by the way, so they can be accessed by anybody. Okay. So where is this going? It's likely we're going to probably see, if you remember the dot-com boom, 99% of those companies are gone, right? They don't exist anymore. You don't see the maids.com, the you know, icecube.com. All those are gone. The likelihood is that probably 99% of the tokens you see out there today, they're going to be gone. But you are also going to probably see the next Google, the next Amazon, the next Facebook, and those are going to come from the blockchain space. You already have companies like Binance, Coinbase, right? You got quite a few Nigerian fintech startups actually that have been doing very well. Uh, and you're seeing all this coming out in the blockchain space. So really the blockchain and Bitcoin are the money of the internet or money 2.0, okay? So it is a big deal for the developed world, right? We had the great recession and now we have COVID. And what we're seeing is that digital currencies are being pushed to become the main way that people transact. Now there's going to be a big battle over which digital currencies in the end, um, but Bitcoin certainly right now is positioned in a very strong position. And regulation is a challenge, right? So different countries, we're gonna talk about that later whether in the US or in China or in Nigeria or other countries, uh, we see a lot of regulation. And of course, as we said, with COVID, the, we're accelerating in our move to digital assets, right? So it's getting faster, this transition. And it's also a big deal for the developed world in terms of, right, it's a stock market 2.0. So lots of companies are now starting to, you know, give access to exchange traded offerings on tokens on blockchains. And you see companies like JP Morgan, they just put out a big announcement, Goldman Sachs, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, the list goes on and on, all investing in blockchain, all making their moves in that space. And of course, banks in the US and other countries now have the authorization to custody digital assets, which is cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. And as you can see some highlights here, 
globally, uh, China is moving forward with their digital yuan, which is their own currency digital. Um, they also have, of course, the digital dollar. People have been talking about it, even though there isn't one really available at the moment. Okay. And then we also have the, you know, you see this being moved out around the world. I don't know that the whole world is going to adopt China's digital yuan, but certainly it's going to be a big player in China and with their trading partners, right, which is a lot of the world right now. So we're seeing a lot of moves by government. In the US, it's more of corporate things like the Facebook coin, the DM, right? So we're seeing all those coins starting to play a big role um, in this space. And then we see the rise of Bitcoin. So a lot of times you're going to hear people say, oh, look, it's so volatile. Bitcoin is so volatile, right? If you go zoom in here, you're going to see this is up and down, up and down, up and down. But this is the thing, right? This line. Look at this trend line. Okay. Look at that trend line. So if we look back in 2010, Bitcoin started in 2009, roughly. In 2010, a programmer paid 10,000 Bitcoins okay, for one pizza. So if I calculate today, that would have been, I believe, a don't want to miscalculate, a $57 million pizza, okay? Something around there at the current price. Won't calculate exactly. So if you are that programmer and, you know, you gave those Bitcoins, you might not be too happy today, but you can see there is a big increase in price that is happening in Bitcoin. Used to be like 10 cents or a dollar back in 2010, 2011. Okay, let's go on. And now we see the rise of Bitcoin today. So actually this is low, this is from a week ago. Uh, the price now is around 56,000, 57,000 US dollars currently. Okay, uh, and the market cap for Bitcoin and the markets is over a trillion dollars currently. And what you're seeing is everybody jumping on board in this space, right? So you're seeing JP Morgan, who used to say it was terrible. And you're seeing NBA team Dallas Mavericks, you know, Mark Cuban, right? You're seeing Tesla. They bought, I think, $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin uh, for their treasury. A lot of companies are buying Bitcoin for their corporate treasury. You got Visa and MasterCard and PayPal, all starting to use Bitcoin, Goldman Sachs, Wall Street, NASDAQ, Africa, all across the continent, right? Endowments, New York Stock Exchange, you name it. They are all moving into the direction of either buying Bitcoin acquiring Bitcoin. And one of the things I think is interesting, so this guy from the uh, Dallas Mavericks, he's on Shark Tank. I don't know how many of you know the show Shark Tank. It's a popular show in the US. There's another guy from Shark Tank called Kevin O'Leary. They call him Mr. Wonderful. And he actually spent probably the last two or three years saying, oh, how bad Bitcoin is, just like this guy did, right? Bitcoin is so bad. Bitcoin is terrible. It's a nothing burger. It turns out that Kevin O'Leary had been buying Bitcoin now for three years plus, since 2017. So what happens is a lot of people who have been saying this publicly, they've actually yeah, privately yeah, been investing. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mute, whoever that is, if you come in, please do mute, welcome. Okay, so let's go on here. So we can see that a lot of people are jumping in. Why is the price rising? Well, anybody, anywhere can transfer money. So as you know, uh, I think most of you will know, I'm Nigerian. I'm a, uh, dad side and we had to transfer some money to the U.S. because he had a medical emergency a few years ago. We couldn't get the money that we needed to get for his medical emergency through the bank because it took so much work to get the transfers done. Um, I was able to send my sister Bitcoin. I could do that in 10 minutes. Okay, So in 10 minutes versus weeks and weeks of paperwork trying to get funds to my dad for a medical emergency. So this is a very big deal about Bitcoin. The ability to move your money when and where you want to. There's a limited supply. So there's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be created in the code, right? That's how many they're going to ever have. So unlike the dollar, right? The dollar, they print it and print it and print it. And there's no limit to how many they can print, right? And then we have that there's no intermediaries between people. So I don't have to go to the bank and go, can you please let me send money to my father? I need to send money from Nigeria. I need to get it over to my dad. I don't have to do that. It's just I can send it right away, right? It is stateless, meaning nobody, not owned by a country or a company, which makes a lot of people nervous because it's not controlled by any one country or company. And it is decentralized, meaning I can send a transaction to Sanjay right now. I don't have to ask anybody. I just need Sanjay's address, right? So that's what we call trustless. 
So institutional adoption of Bitcoin, this is what's really driving the price rise right now. You can see Next Tech buy 2 million in Bitcoin treasury. Every day, there's more stories of companies putting Bitcoin in their treasury. So those of you guys who are, you know, business background, companies store money, you know, for a rainy day. And the way they do that, they've been doing it in cash and they've been moving increasingly to store it in Bitcoin. Okay, Evolves Files. Uh, so we got another one for an ETF. This is in Canada. I think there's two ETFs in Canada now. Exchange traded offerings on the stock market and the Canadian Stock Exchange. And in the US, the OCC green lights the use of stable coins, which are a kind of Bitcoin or blockchain. Uh, and these are approved by federal banks to use now. And in Southeast Asia, here in Singapore, DBS Bank, which is one of the leading banks here, has approved and they have a full line of uh, Bitcoin exchange offerings now uh, from their bank. Now, if you are American, like I am Nigerian, but American, um, it's a little harder to use that because of our regulations, but uh, that is now available in Singapore. Okay. This is something called the Bitcoin stock to flow model. Okay. So this has been a very accurate model since 2010. So if you look back there and you go back and you look since 2010, okay, you can see the price model. Welcome from London. Okay. The price model has been very accurate. So it used to be like a penny, 10 cents, $10. We are currently up here in 2020, right? Price model is saying we should be around somewhere in the middle, which is around $50,000. And that's where we are. We're about 56, 57,000 right now. Now here's what's interesting. What you see is this model tells us it's based on scarcity. So how much Bitcoin is there? How much can be mined every year, right? And how much is available still? And this model tells us that by 2024, 2025, we are probably looking at a million dollar Bitcoin, okay? Now that's not financial advice and it's not a guarantee, but I'm just telling you that this model has been very accurate so far, okay? And one of the other things you'll see, they do the same thing for gold, right? So how much gold is in the ground? They have an, an idea. How much can we get out every year? You got to stock the flow. I think gold stock to flow is 62. Currently Bitcoin's stock to flow is at 52 and it should go to 113 the next time that it happens. So we have these halvings that happen, right? So its price is already way higher than gold and that's likely to continue to increase. Okay, so you can see here, this is the performance of Bitcoin, right? Over last year, it's up roughly 700%. Now, I don't know what the last price is I put on this one, actually more than that this week, okay? And up roughly 1,100%, 1,100% from March, which is a price low last year. So obviously there's no other asset class that even comes near to this kind of increase, even with all the volatility, okay? So we can see here in 2020, this I think is very interesting, the performance of some of these different altcoins, right? Celsius Network was at 3,584%, Theta, 1,928%, Chainlink, 540%, Ethereum, Bitcoin is at about 302%, Cardano, which is here actually, right? Uh, Polkadot, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see very high returns, um, unlike money in the bank, which is at 0% right now, or negative interest. And this I superimposed because I thought this was really interesting. Somebody shared this in a group yesterday. Um, if you're in the US or another country that has COVID stimulus, if you would have invested your $1,200 COVID stimulus in the market, these are the returns, right? So you'd have $1,600 for the stock markets. Tesla would have gotten you $4,600. Bitcoin is at nearly $10,000 from that $1,200. Ethereum was at $14,000. GameStop, of course, that was from the Wall Street bets. I won't get into that. That's not a cryptocurrency though. And then ADA, Cardano, which does a lot of Africa use cases, actually about $44,000, $45,000, actually which will peak of about $55,000 um, based on that 1,200 stimulus uh, investment from last year. So obviously if in the US, we might wanna think about uh, using some of that stimulus coming up here, but that is again, not financial advice. Okay, let's go on. So applications and use cases. Right. If you do have questions, you can type them in the chat box. I may not take them until the end, but Sanjay can also help to answer them. He's helping me to uh, take questions. Okay. So coin, we can see here, cryptocurrency, you got Bitcoin. The main use case of it is it's a store of value. It's digital gold, basically. It's not very fast, but 
a lot of people say, well, you know, why don't we use a faster one? It's not as fast as Visa. It's not as fast as this other coin. But here's the thing. If you have gold, right? And somebody says, oh, you know what? Uh, we have platinum. Our platinum is shiny and it's more lightweight. Are you going to give them your gold and take the platinum instead because it's shiny and lightweight? Who's going to do that? Who's going to give up their gold so they can get some shiny and lighter weight platinum? Who is going to do that? Anybody? Who's put in the chat? Anybody going to trade their gold for platinum? Okay, I'm taking a guess, even though you guys are quiet, that the answer is probably no. And that's the same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is effectively digital gold. Okay, so that's its use case. Ethereum is basically the smart contracts, and it's kind of a supercomputer you can think of for the internet. Uh, it allows you to be able to do transactions. You'll see later the company that my startup company, um, we use these smart contracts for business and trade with Africa, actually. Okay. And this is used by a lot of the other tokens actually are using Ethereum. Oops. Okay. We have Ripple, which is kind of for the banking industry. It's a corporate and banking coin. It's not really decentralized, owned by really one organization, Ripple. And it is faster and cheaper than the SWIFT network. So if you guys know the SWIFT network for banking, this is much faster, much cheaper for cross-border payments. We have Cardano, which I like quite a lot. It's an alternative to Ethereum. It does a lot of work in Africa and financial inclusion projects. And by the way, if you saw on that chart a couple of slides ago, Cardano has gone up a lot in price, right? So this has been doing really well. And then Monero is what we call a privacy coin. It's designed to be untraceable. So obviously governments and law enforcement don't like Cardano at all, or Monero, excuse me, Monero. Um, however, I will note for you guys that Bitcoin, if, if somebody's a criminal, Bitcoin's a really bad choice for you because I can trace every transaction you do on Bitcoin. So when you hear the narrative that Bitcoin is used for crime, that's pretty ridiculous. I, if you're a criminal, you'd be much better off to use US dollars, honestly, okay? Hopefully nobody here is a criminal, but if you were. <laughs> Facebook Libra coin, now rebranded as DM. So this is a corporate coin, right? Facebook has like 25 different uh, countries and companies partnering, and they are using it basically a basket of currencies to back this currency, uh, which will be usable by users of Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. US regulators were concerned about it. I don't think they're so concerned anymore. I've seen organizations like Tomasic and Singapore and other investors now getting on board as far as Facebook DM. So I think this is something that a lot of people are backing. Um, I will note for you, this is a kind of a private coin, which means let's say for some reason you get kicked off of Facebook, you're gonna lose your coins, right? You're gonna lose your currency. So keep that in mind. There are different types of blockchain based cryptocurrencies. And then we have central bank currencies. I think the most famous right now would be the digital yuan, right? So China's been pushing out their yuan. In part, that's because they want a currency that's controlled by their government. Now, let's say that you live in Saudi Arabia. Let's say you live in Dubai. Let's say you live in Nigeria. You may or may not want the digital yuan, right? Because do you want your currency to be one that's controlled by China? Maybe you don't, maybe you do, right? So that's a big question. World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, they're looking at digital currencies. You got digital things like obviously our Bitcoin, digital dollar, they're looking for stimulus now, digital yen, right? We've got all kinds of digital currencies that are coming on the scene, many for central banks. Now I will tell you the central bank digital currencies, they're not much different than the regular traditional fiat currencies. Because unlike Bitcoin, you know, they're not censorship resistant. Anybody, you know, they're controlled by the same government. And I don't think there's likely going to be much of a restriction on being able to print as much as you want, right? So these are not so different from traditional currencies. And then another use case is cross-border transfer. So I told you how I had a really hard time sending money to my dad, um, right, from Nigeria, sending it over to my father, who's in the US right now. And uh, some of the coins you could use for that, Ripple is designed for banks to use, really this is for banks. I mean, I could use Bitcoin without a bank but banks would use Ripple. And also Stellar is kind of a offshoot of Ripple by some of the people from that team. 
And it's also meant to be done cross-border payments. So instead of the bank transfer with the SWIFT network, instead of using Western Union, you could use Stellar or you could use Ripple to do your cross-border transfers. Okay. And then this is another use case that's becoming very popular called distributed finance. Okay. So you have Chainlink, you have a lot of the other ones. And this, you can currently put like your Cardano or other coins uh, into a wallet, like Exodus is one of the wallets you can use. And you can get 7% interest on it, 8% interest, 5% interest. Now compare that to a bank account where currently you're getting zero, right? Zero or negative interest rates. Um, so DeFi is a really big area right now where people can stake, they call it staking their currency, uh, and they can make a return just by holding those cryptocurrencies. And I think that's a very good use case. U.S. banks now have the green light to custody, and some people don't you know, think, oh, this is a big deal, but this is a big, big deal. Think about the fact that every bank of the United States has the right to now hold cryptocurrencies, right? So you see all the banks, JP Morgan, they're all coming out with all these investment products, right? So this is telling you that this space is here to stay. Uh, and this is something that that's why you see so many high net worth individuals and rich people getting into this space. And then we have the tokenization of real assets. So there's digital gold, real gold being tokenized like in safe Singapore and London. Uh, you have the tokenization of artwork. So a lot of you've been hearing a lot of probably non-fungible tokens. That's a lot of these uh, recording artists and musicians have been actually making tokens on their, their blockchain for their artwork or for their music or their songs, right? This is uh, very hot right now. Um, it's kind of the new, the new trend, right? Um, but there's a lot of things. You can have tokenized real estate, so Manhattan real estate, I guess before COVID, um, was being tokenized and that's you know very pricey real estate and you could buy those as tokens. And this is something, let's say you're in Nigeria and you, know, you have some land or whatever it is, you may be able to in the future tokenize that land uh, so that you can then get investment or you can raise funds if you're gonna build a hotel and build a factory. Okay. Stable coins, these are stable coins, right? These basically are just tied like to the dollar or the euro, mostly the dollar, because the dollar is still the world reserve currency, even though that is starting to shift and change, right? So you have USDT, which is Tether, USDC, which is US dollar coin. Uh, these are gonna just stay the price of the dollar. So if you're looking to invest in something, these wouldn't be a good investment unless you're gonna just put them into staking and maybe get some interest on them. Uh, but other than that, these are not going to go up in value. They may go down actually because the dollar has been devaluing recently. Okay, so let's look at regulation and taxes. I'm trained as a lawyer, as you might have heard there. So um, this is something that I'm pretty familiar with. So China, cryptocurrencies are not legal tender. Uh, they do a lot of mining, although I think they're, they're backing down on that a little bit. And cryptocurrency exchanges are legal, although Binance is one of the biggest exchanges in the world. And that is basically partly Chinese only. United States, cryptocurrencies are not tender. They're considered to be property. In Singapore, it's not legal tender, but you have to just register the monetary authority of Singapore if you can have a company that's exchanging your cryptocurrencies. In the EU, it's legal tender. Um, and member states may not introduce their own cryptocurrencies. And then cryptocurrency exchange regulations may vary by state. In Australia, you can see has uh, their legal tender treated as property. Okay, so varying laws. In taxes, basically like in the US, you have to treat it like a property. So if you have a year or longer, you get a long-term capital gains tax. If it's shorter, you get a shorter uh, capital gains tax. Okay, we have a question there. I'm going to transfer over to the main group, Amade. Um, so maybe uh, Sanjay can help, but I'll, answer, I'll try to answer this uh, for you a little bit later. Okay. That's a group of star work. Yep. Remind me of that question um, in a little bit later here. Okay. And then you can basically, you pay your taxes at the end of the year. Trading is a little trickier because every time you trade, you have a taxable transaction. And then Nigeria, actually. Where are we? Okay. So Nigeria, actually about, what is this, a month ago, uh, actually banned banks from using cryptocurrencies. Uh, you can see this was right after that happened. 
there's a 38% premium on the price of Bitcoin in Nigeria. Many of you may not know this, but Nigeria is actually the second largest market for Bitcoin after the, I think the United States. Uh, and even with the, the bank ban, which is probably hurting fintechs. I mean, I've got a cousin who's in the fintech space and I think that's hurt him, hurt other fintech players uh, in Nigeria, unfortunately, we had quite a lot of really great fintechs coming up. Um, but basically the central bank said, no, we're not allowing the banks to use this. Although there is another guidance from the Singapore SEC, or sorry, the Nigeria's SEC, which says that uh, these are securities. So those really don't match necessarily. But I think that regulation, getting that right, is very important. Okay. So let's take a look at potential for Africa and developing markets. Yes. All right. So there are many projects that are going across Africa for cryptocurrencies. You can see you have the Odua coin, which is a pan African digital currency, it was introduced recently on the um, ADBI. We have Stellar and Acon's A coin. Okay. And we have the Cardano, which I talked about has been doing really well. Acoin, which is tied to um, Acon, the rapper and artist in, from Senegal, and Stellar for the cross border. Again, they're doing a lot of projects, which are actually Acoin is backed by Stellar. It's on the Stellar network. So let's take a look here at some of the other projects for. In Africa, it's very different, right? So much of the developed world has easy access to banks, credit, finance, you know, that's the banked world. But in Africa, that's not necessarily true for a lot of the population. So the developing world, the blockchain is an opportunity to access finance you just couldn't have before. In Zimbabwe, the currency is devaluing so quickly with hyperinflation. Bitcoin basically allows people to keep the value of their money. And the blockchain's transparency also eliminates a lot of issues with corruption that may be an issue, right? So we can track, like I said, every place that that Bitcoin goes, we can track who has it. We can even put a smart contract to put rules in as to who gets it, when and how they get it. All right, so let's take a look at this one. It's from South Africa. As you may have guessed, we're not in Silicon Valley anymore. This is Kailisha, one of the biggest and poorest townships in South Africa. What are you cooking? I'm cooking the Afghan meat. And whether you're into crypto to make money or to save the world, emerging markets like this might be the place to be. My view is that this is where the blockchain should start. In the US or in sophisticated countries, the way I see blockchain is the blockchain is kind of like a fun thing. It's a movement against centralization and it's a fun technology game that everybody's playing, but it's not a necessity. You certainly don't need it. In Africa, you actually need it. The biggest problem, it's nearly impossible here to get or send money. Look around you. There's no infrastructure. Here. There's no idea. Here. How do they get the money? And if you think it's any better in the big cities, think again. My name is Kudakwashe Ian Chingan. Kudakwashe. Yeah, Kudakwashe. Or Ian. Or Ian. <laughs> like so many others in Cape Town, our Uber driver Ian migrated from another part of the continent in search of work. Cape Town is like New York. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's got family back home. Yeah, yeah. They got money back. They're definitely sending money back. Ian included. He's got a mother and brother back in Zimbabwe, but sending them money far from easy. And you can't transfer money with the bank? It takes days or weeks. And sometimes the bank doesn't get money. It's a hassle. More than a hassle. It could be the difference between life and death. I like recently, I sent money to my mother. She was going to the hospital. So I, I wanted to send money to the bank. Unable to wait for a bank transfer, Ian used a money wiring service. It was immediate, yes. But the downside? Does it cost money? 10%. 10%? 10%. It's a lot which brings us to a very interesting third option of sending money in Africa. To the bus. To the bus. Yeah, what does that mean? To find out, Ian took me to where it all goes down. This is the bus stop uh, that I was talking about. You approach the driver, then you talk to him. Are you able uh, to, to assist me? Then the driver will say yes, and you wish good luck. The bus will arrive. 
and then I hand him the money. Yeah. And that's the agreement. That's the agreement, it's yes. Just a verbal it's a verbal agreement. agreement, yes. And you so hope that, that he takes the money where he yes, wants yes, to Yes, yes, that's true, that's true. And from there, well, things get a little dicey. And if the bus gets a flat tire. <laughs> Sometimes the delay, bus goes oh, down. Oh, the bus is going to get oh, yeah, robbed. Robbed. Back in the car, I was still stunned. Yeah. It seems kind of crazy to go to a bus and hand over your hard-earned money yeah. to him and say, please bring this to my family. I trust you. Yeah. It's just something that most people wouldn't do. You just want to survive. I wish there was another option. Uh, that is safe and cheap to send money. All right, so you can see the use case in Africa is very different. In the West and the and kind of developed financial markets, it is, uh, maybe I'll use this investment, maybe I'll use that investment, maybe I'll get gold, maybe I'll get some you know, commodities, maybe I'll get Bitcoin. In Africa, this is really something that's an opportunity for economic inclusion and empowerment is connecting African diaspora. So you'll see in my platform in a minute that we are actually connecting people from the Americas, the Caribbean, the UK, around the world, African diaspora, Friends of Africa, to be able to fund different projects in Africa and on the continent, right? Many blockchain projects and businesses and other opportunities. And then also networking, creating a global community, and as I call it, a digital Wakanda, right? So making a place where everybody's able to actually benefit financially from these developments in blockchain and Bitcoin and altcoins. So you can see the unbanked and underbanked, this represents about two thirds of the world's population. Right. Obviously, the heaviest area for this is Africa. So there's a lot of people. They can't access the bank. They can't get a loan. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, from from Nigeria, and he was saying, "Well, you know, it costs me. You know, basically, I can only get 25% uh, interest in order to borrow money uh, to expand my business, and then it's another only 30% of the value of the asset. So it's it makes more sense for me either to not take the money or just sell my asset rather than to take the money." So there's a very big difference if you are in these unbanked or underbanked areas than if you're in the West and you're in these banked areas where you actually have access to capital, okay? And the blockchain is really changing this. I'll switch this blockchain is my company. I'll switch this agile blockchain. So I'll tell you briefly about what we're doing. We do projects to empower the developing world through blockchain and cryptocurrency and allowing people to use the blockchain to invest um, in projects on African continents throughout the country and from people in the diaspora as well as Friends of Africa, right? So being able to invest and support and we partner and we'll take a look at that. I'm gonna mute, give me a second, thank you, welcome. And our mission facilitate the movement of funds into Africa, driving practical investments for growth opportunities to bring meaningful changes to the region and a better life for people in a brighter, stronger Africa. Let's watch, uh, little intro on how that platform, our platform works. This is Charlie. Charlie's an African-American living in the US and he would like to be able to invest in Africa. Unfortunately, he doesn't know anybody there and he really doesn't know how to go about it and how to safely and transparently uh, invest funds or lend funds to projects in Africa. So a little confused as to what to do. But with our ScanPay platform from Auspicious Blockchain, we enable investments and funding and lending from Western Financial System to projects in Africa. Let's take a look at how this works using our Auspicious Blockchain ScanPay platform. So we start out with Charlie wanting to invest in a particular project. So he will go ahead and select the bank or financial institution in the US that he would like to be able to invest from, which would also work from Singapore and other locations around the world as well. And from there, he decides to exchange into some Bitcoin. He could do another cryptocurrency like a US dollar tether or another, but he chooses to go to Bitcoin, well-known currency. And he moves that over and he creates in his ScanPay wallet in the app, a new debit card, which is going to be able to hold those funds for him. So he creates the, uh, the new uh, debit card and you can see a list here of Charlie's debit card. So he is ready now to go ahead and look for a project that he wants to fund. So now Charlie's gonna go through, look at a list of different African countries that he's interested in that are available on the platform. And he sees Ghana, which is one he's heard a lot of good things about from the year of return last year in 2019. And so he chooses Ghana and he goes to a list of projects in Ghana and he sees a couple are available. 
and maybe some others. So he picks one of those and he then goes ahead and funds along with others who are crowdfunding. And he gives to a farming project that is happening in Ghana with Io and Laddie, we're local farmers. So he sends those funds over to Io and Laddie and they are now able to produce a great output of produce and a good crop that they are able to now either return a return on investment or return on a loan back to Charlie through the platform. It goes back into his debit or credit account. They can use the, uh, their account on that, the platform as well if they wish. And then that can go back to either a digital asset or cryptocurrency, or it can go back directly to his bank account in the US, all following existing payment mechanisms. Charlie's been able to help the African continent and he's been able to invest and benefit himself. Okay, so that's how the our platform works. This the idea of that is to be able to allow people to be able to invest in and support Africa using blockchain. Okay, this is my contact information. I'm going to start tapping a few questions here. We're going to go to Q&A. I saw some in the comments I'm going to go for, and then I'll let anybody else who has questions as well. We are, by the way, for ours, which is our suspicious blockchain, um, we are actually accepting seed investors for that. Um, the meetups, you guys know the Wakanda meetups, and of course the NIDO organization. I think everybody knows the group, the Nigerian Indigenous Diaspora uh, overseas. So I'm going to tackle a couple of questions that came in here, and then we'll open it up for general questions. Okay. Somebody asked about non fungible tokens. If there was more uh, on that, uh, let's see who had that question about non fungible tokens here. Where are they? So non fungible tokens, Eileen, you had a question. Uh, about non-fungible tokens and uh, your professional musician, if you can use those. Did yes. you want to ask more on that? Um, yes, because I'm, I'm really new to this. Um, I attended a music industry, you know, Zoom this weekend. It's something that um, is being looked at. But aside from YouTube videos, I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm, this is something I've just, I actually heard about it first on your Zoom last week, which I did join. So um, I'm launching new music as well. I do other things, but I'm doing that as well. And I have no idea how to approach it. What's the safest or um, best way? So if you could expand on that, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> so I, I don't want to say, I guess, in a bad way, non-fungible tokens are a good idea. They're like a unique token that represents something in the real world, like a piece of art or a piece of real estate or a, you know, a gold bar. Okay, yeah. And you can buy those and you can buy those on... Uh, I think Binance is a platform that's offering them currently. Um, probably the most reputable platform I'm aware of. There is one that's uh, kind of like the original one that's been doing them. I, I don't want to call it a fad, but I mean, it definitely is very trendy right now. Yes. You know, it's token. So it's not like this is very established. It's very new. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't think, oh, you know, this is something that's been around. This is something that's just starting to, you know, just start out. I'm actually looking. There's another platform that somebody just mentioned in a group here. I want to see if I can give you the name. Okay, thank you. Um, that platform. Sanjay, did you want to comment while I'm looking for the name of that platform? Yeah, so I'm, I'm being encouraged by my um, her music coach to look into it. Um, mm -hmm. She mentioned some artists like Kings of Leon. They did like a multi-million dollar album yeah. launch, which is which is a huge deal in, <laughs> in our world. Um, another group I think is Disclosure. So I'm not really familiar with it. It's, it's definitely a trend, but it seems like people are talking so, about the bandwagon. The name that I have here, CryptoPunks, I've never looked into them. They apparently are one of the original groups that have been working with non-fungible tokens. Crypto. Um, you can look CryptoPunks, C-R-Y-P-T-O-P-U-N-K-S. I don't know anything about them, honestly, but my understanding is they're one of the original uh, groups or organizations that's been involved with non-fungible tokens. And okay. then I guess more well-known now is Binance, right? Which okay. is a more, you know, so I'll give you the two names here in the comments. Crypto punks, this is kind of like the original, apparently. Uh, I do not know much about them though. And then there is Binance, which I believe is now offering non-fungible tokens as well on their platform. Okay. okay, so those are places you could look. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you had any other comment before I go on from that one. Yeah, uh, so there, there are a few uh, places like Nifty Gateway and uh, so you, 
well, ideally you should do a little bit of research, but uh, yes, for NFTs, it's becoming very popular with artists and advantage is that uh, when you have that, every every time somebody purchases your music you will you will get rewarded so that is the biggest advantage uh, so that's why a lot of artists are going into it so and you can also reward the other people involved if you're in a in a group for example or a band so you know the sound creator music creator you can uh, you can give them commissions of each sale and uh, depending if you have a limited amount of uh, uh, songs released so that you could release it so that it can be listened to only, let's say, 100,000 times, right? So that drives the value of your... Uh, it, it's more like a cryptocurrency, but in art. So okay. I would suggest uh, doing a bit of research because it's fairly new, but there are a couple of platforms which you can launch your products on at the okay. moment. Yeah. And I'll make another load on this one as well, which is that uh, this is not for music, but this is for gold. Uh, they have, you know, basically non-fungible tokens for gold. I had thought about buying some of those. In the end, I decided against it. I decided just to get physical gold. Uh, and then, you know, for obviously if I wanted Bitcoin or crypto, I just bought the crypto um, because I kind of felt the use case was a little different for me. And I didn't necessarily want a token that represented the gold. I wanted one or the other. But I think this is an interesting area. It's going to develop, and especially if you're an artist um, or music, musician, this is something good to look into because there is a lot of potential here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me go to another question. Amede, uh, you said, who manages the investment for the farmers? Do you want to repeat your question? Um, you want to go off mute? Amede? Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you, Mr. Okoro. I'm speaking from Nigeria and I was quite uh, interested in the funds transfer because I'm sure you, you are aware of the difficulties to do transfers. So I just wanted to understand how that works when you did it using the Stella and the coins. And I'm not used to crypto. This is actually the first time getting into crypto with the Dua coin. So for me, I just actually use Bitcoin for my transfer. So Bitcoin, all that's required is what we call an address. Okay, an address is just a series of letters and numbers. Yeah, and I if I give that address, then I can send it to anybody. I can send it to you. I can send it to my sister, you know, okay. in the US. I can send it to anybody um, I want. Stellar, the reason that people use Stellar, uh, so like my cousin's project, he pegged basically the Naira to um, your to the European currencies using Stellar, okay? So he's able to ha hold some European currencies or euros, and then he's able to use the Stellar network to send it back and forth, okay? I, I think they've run into some difficulty because of the new regulation, but um, so they use the Stellar network for that reason. Let me go back. Okay, so they use the Stellar network to do that, right? This one, uh, and that basically is the backing for a lot of projects because it allows you to peg your Naira and get liquidity in dollars or euros, right? Now, if all you care about is just moving Bitcoin, you don't need to do that. You so if you're Bitcoin. using Bitcoin, do it, okay? Okay, so if you move for Bitcoin on the other side, can cash it out in dollars, I guess, using the exchanges. Yes, so let's say you get it to the US, you get it to Europe, or you can just go to a bank and they'll, they'll they can, you can, basically make the exchange into local currency. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And then in the example of um, funding the farmers, the farmer projects using Bitcoin, yeah. mm -hmm. could you please explain to me how that will work on the side of the farmers, the foreign investment in farming activities, necessary return are generated to pay back the investments. Hmm. So for that, and that's so our platform, we don't use any one particular currency. We can use Bitcoin, we can use USDC, we can use Ethereum, we can use any of the different currencies. And the idea is, this. so we are piloting right now in Ghana. Okay, so we're piloting with an agribusiness uh, in Ghana, we'll probably work in Nigeria coming up here. 
And mm -hmm. if the farmer has a bank account, well, then we can just transfer to their bank account, right? If they oh, don't okay. have a bank account, because a lot of farmers don't have bank accounts. If they don't you have it, then we can do mobile money, right? We can go to mobile money. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have mobile money, we can just give them directly a Bitcoin or Ethereum or USDT in their, their mobile wallet, right? Okay. So it gives an option, even if they don't have a bank account, even if they don't have mobile money, we can still just send them the cryptocurrency directly. Um, and that means that people who couldn't receive funds, now they can receive the funds. Yes. Now, after that is actually what my main question is. Now, I'm a farmer. I cash out the funds sent to me and I produce the funds. Now, how do I pay back the investor? Okay, so we use smart contracts. Remember I talked about on Ethereum network, we have smart contracts? Yes. So this basically says, okay, Mede, before I send the funds to you, I need to know if you have the land. I need to see that you have this crop. Once we okay. verify, somebody there verifies you have the crop, then I say, okay, now I can give you the next part of the funds. Once I okay. receive that, then I say, okay, now I need you to give a return to the people that you lent you the money, right? Or invest okay. in. When you give a return, then I can give you more. So that's all managed on the blockchain by what we call smart contracts. And we have people okay. on the ground in person to oh. verify. Okay, so they're done in tranches. Okay. All right, thank you. Yep, no problem. Let me go back down here. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, let's go to the next question that we had here, which was who controls digital currencies? I think, Abaje, uh, did you want to elaborate on that question? Abaje, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yes. So your question, I think, was who controls the digital currency? Is that what you were asking? Yes. And I was just, um, yes. Thank you for your presentation. And I was just thinking that if um, digital currency could be, um, could be launched by uh, anyone and you can determine the quantity of the uh, digital currency that you want to launch, um, do you think, do you foresee digital currency becoming like uh, any like um, digit, I mean like uh, debit cards or other form of exchange that is controlled uh, by either governments or individuals or companies in future? And if that is the case, um, how do you foresee an international regulatory for uh, to prevent every Dick and Harry uh, jumping into this uh, arena and also creating a, a very uh, very clean form of exchange. I mean, if I have my digital currency, you have your digital currency and we want to exchange. Um, currently, the, the store value of the digital currency is not properly de determined except for the quantity that's available in the market and the demand, okay? So if I launch my digital currency and I want it to have a high value and uh, instead of making uh, launch 1 billion of it, if I launch just... Um, a few thousand units, of course, definitely. I mean, if companies like Facebook launching and so mm -hmm. it becomes a system where um, everybody, depending on how popular you are and the demand that you think you can generate, you can launch. So how do you foresee the future of digital currency in an environment, in such an environment that there's no international um, consensus for control of quantity and value. Thank you. That is a great question. And I'm going to go back a slide here. So hold on, I'll come back to content for a little later if anybody missed this, but let's go back here. So you remember this picture um, uh, on the unbank? Okay. So a lot of the regulation that you're speaking of really lies in the banked regions, right? So there's very clear regulation in the EU, in the US, uh, UK, et cetera. Uh, but for a lot of the unbanked regions, 
there is not, you know, th there's really no framework, right? Because this, a lot of people just don't have access to funds in the first place. Now, I think that some of you have probably have heard of the great reset or the financial reset, which is basically a shift to digital currencies, right? That is happening right now. You know, we talk about central banks moving to their digital currencies, the US talking about theirs, China's talking about their digital currency. I think it's very important for Nigeria, it's very important for Africa to have a strategy in mind, right? Are you gonna use Bitcoin? Are you going to use another digital currency? But we have to be careful because we know, I mean, we've seen the Naira devalue against the dollar for a long time, right? We've seen like Zimbabwe, hyperinflation in their currency, Venezuela as well, Argentina. So it's very important. There are, there are currently around almost 9,000 currencies, Obaja, around the world, digital blockchain. There are probably going to be more, and then probably a lot of them are going to disappear, and we're not gonna see a lot of those in the future. There will be more regulation, but it's not going to be controlled by one country, okay? Each country you know, will probably regulate to some degree, um, but these currencies really are more universal around the world. So Bitcoin is not just a American currency, it's not just Chinese, it's not just Nigerian, it's not just Indian, it's basically global, which is very different. It's like the currency of the internet. Okay, so regulation is a little bit tricky here um, because the regulation that I have in Singapore right now is not the same regulation that Sanjay has in Malaysia or somebody in Thailand or Nigeria is going to have. So a lot of this is going to evolve over time. Thank you very much. And that is why I want to ask you my final question on this. Then will you recommend for Africa right now? What will you recommend for Africa in this uh, imagine situation. Do you think, because I can tell you uh, from a uh, position of scientist that um, the raw materials that, I mean, it used to be said that raw materials had no value. It was the, um, the technology that transformed the raw materials into finished goods that had value, okay? And so Africa have been you know, selling their raw materials at a very low end, ship it to uh, Europe, America, transform it, and then they buy it back in a very, very high end. Unfortunately, this is no longer the situation. Technology, the common, I mean, technology, uh, I mean, no, I'm not talking about high-end technology going to the moon, but the basic technology for converting raw materials into finished consuming goods have become so cheap that you can get technology if you want to convert your sand into glass or into whatever materials, you can now have a choice to get it from China or from Russia, from Germany, from wherever. There are so many varieties of technology you can use to make your automobile, to make whatever. So raw materials will exceedingly become more valuable than some of this technology for refining, for even electricity, generation of electricity is no longer um, you know, high-end technology. And Africa has the raw materials. We also have the consuming population, meaning the market. I mean, you are aware that uh, the population in developed countries are going down. In Singapore, for instance, we are, now we need to even pay people to give birth to children, right? Um, and but in Africa, we have huge markets. So everybody is rushing to send their goods to Africa. Now, what will you advise Africa? Do you think this is an opportune time for Africa to create their own crypto, I mean, uh, digital currency that is based on valuation of raw materials and the consuming market and be able to take charge of their own currency as a form of exchange? Or do you think that we should write on digital currencies that have already been created by um, you know, Western world, Chinese, uh, America, and all that. Uh, what would you recommend for Africa at I this moment? That, Thank you. That, Obaje, that's an excellent question. I'm going I'm to touch on like 15 different things here. So try to stay with me. Um, okay. So when you know, when you say, I absolutely think that Africa needs to 
like China used to be way behind the West in technology, right? Like 30 years ago, China used to be way behind the West. And what they did is they leapfrogged. So they learned the technology. They also leapfrogged into wireless when the West was still using wireline technology, right? So now China is a leader in technology. They leapfrogged the West. And I think that in financial technology, Africa now has the opportunity to leapfrog the West and possibly even China if Africa is very effective at adopting blockchain and these cryptocurrency technologies and Bitcoin. Here's how I believe that happens. And to go to your point, uh, Yaha, um, this, is a, uh, this is not financial advice. So I think if that was your question, not financial advice. <laughs> this is only my opinion, okay? So um, to note on that, but the opportunity for Africa is very, is very straightforward here that we have the chance now in fact, Kenya was in the news recently. They said Kenya, you know, was now going to use Bitcoin. I think it might have been like a, it was satire, but Kenya was going to use Bitcoin as their, you know, as a currency um, in their country, right? But this underpins a very important point. Most of the Western coins and currencies are going to be backed by Bitcoin, okay? That's why the companies, the corporations, the countries, even though they're not saying it, but the stock markets, they're all backing they're purchasing Bitcoin. To the so if Africa buys the Bitcoin, you can have like Odua coin, which I think somebody mentioned Odua coin, right? And Odua coins uh, by, uh, I think a Nigerian, and there's one other guy, he's based in California, uh, but he created that coin. Okay, so we could use that coin, but what you need to have your treasury, you need to have Bitcoin in the treasury. You need to have backing, just like banks have gold in their treasury today, right? Yeah, right, that's correct. Um, so just like banks have the, the uh, gold in their treasury, they're supposed to today, right? In the digital age, companies and countries are going to have Bitcoin in their treasury, and then they'll create their own currency, like an Odua, like a, whatever, Pan-African, um, it might be an A-coin, it might be whatever it is, right? But the idea is you want to hold that Bitcoin now, whether you're a person or a country or a company, hold that in your treasury, because that is going up. Like I said, look. 10 years ago, you could have bought Bitcoin for 10 cents. Now it's nearly $60,000. And that trend from what I showed you, the stock to flow, that's not going away. It's going to keep going that way, okay? That's why you hear Tesla, what's his name? Elon Musk, you hear MicroStrategy, you hear Wall Street, you hear JP Morgan, they keep on saying, oh, we're getting into Bitcoin. What do they mean by that? We're getting into Bitcoin. They mean we're putting Bitcoin away and then we're going to offer you something else, but we're backing a Bitcoin. So if Africa and Nigeria and all of us, we move, we need to hold Bitcoin in our treasury, our personal treasury and our country treasuries. And then we can create whatever currency or whether it be a DUA or some other coin we want to use. And we can use that to transact with one another. We can use our commodities. We can sell them using those currencies and it will give a lot of value to our currency. But we need to move, my opinion, okay? We need to move now. We can't wait until China comes up and says, oh, this is how we're gonna do it. America says, this is how we're gonna do it. Africa and Nigeria and African nations need to move. Like we said from the beginning, you know, Ghana was one of the first, uh, you know, decolonized countries. And this to me is really an extension of being decolonized. We need to decolonize our finances. Does that yeah. answer your question, Babaji? Uh, thank you, okay. thank you, thank you very much for your uh, for answering. And I think that um, Bitcoin, uh, you know, holding into the treasury, I get your point. Um, the only thing now, I think that Africa has a lot of natural resources that they can use as their treasury, and if they if they if they can come together and hold their natural resources and their population, the consuming market as instruments of the treasury. They can even have African digital currency that is more powerful than Bitcoin, because we are not valuing our, our raw material right now. So we're going to look for abstract treasury is, uh, instrument like Bitcoin, like even gold. You know, do you know how, what percentage of the gold in the, in the, in the whole international system are taken from Africa, you understand? All the banking system. So it's a matter of 
of you know understanding what we have, the value of what we have. And I think that instead of looking to hold uh, you know Bitcoin in our current to give valuation, I think we have more than Bitcoin in African treasury. Uh, it's just that we need uh, young people like yourself, like myself, to think outside the box and come out with some, a system that value what we have. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I see some yeah. other comments here. This is really a very important discussion, I think, because I think this is really setting the course for the future uh, for Africa, for Nigeria, for African countries and for our children and coming up generations. Uh, and I think that Bitcoin is something you hold at least in the interim. I agree. I mean, gold, there's so many natural resources across Africa, but the problem is right now that those are really almost being devalued because you know other currencies are the ones that determine the value, right? So we need to have in the interim Bitcoin and then in the long term an African currency that will determine the value. Okay, okay. thank you so much, John. And um, yeah, everyone, um, Sanjay, uh, this has been a very fantastic uh, presentation. We will continue with the Q&A session. But before then, um, it's already 13 minutes uh, past the hour. And I uh, would just like to close our one hour session, first of all, and then we will continue uh, with the Q&A. So uh, Moshud is in now. Moshud, if you have one or two words and uh, we can close the session and continue the Q&A. Yeah, okay, sure, uh, Harry. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling from Nigeria. So thank you very much, John and uh, Sanjay. That was a wonderful presentation, especially looking at uh, what is happening now and uh, Bitcoin being the, the vibes of the, of the day, especially here in Nigeria. So, I mean, we wish we could have more time to extend this presentation, but because we have to drag everybody out of their busy schedule, but you've done the best you can to compress this uh, wonderful topic within uh, the 30 minutes of presentation. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Uh, Besides that, I also thank all the participants, the NIDA Singapore member, and also the Wakanda blockchain uh, group as well for taking their time to join this uh, uh, web seminar. I also like to thank uh, the NIDO organizing committee. They put uh, uh, within their schedule, they put so much hard work to get this done within this uh, short time. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, in case if you don't know, this is the first uh, of the series of uh, webinar we'll be organizing from NIDO Singapore. So we hope to get more of this out. And uh, this is a wonderful platform. Any of our NIDO members that have uh, wonderful ideas to share, because I think uh, we have to take the future of uh, Nigeria, Africa into our hands. And uh, we have the wealth of knowledge, which I think everybody can share with this platform. So let's look forward uh, to further presentation that will be coming up in the near future. Thank you very much once again, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Yeah. So I'll go thank you, Moshud. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Moshud. Um, thank you, everyone. So I'll just uh, hand back to John. There are a few other questions uh, in the chat box uh, that still require some response. Yeah, so we had actually, Tom, I think this is your question. Will the price go up if more people or countries adopt? Is that the question? Yes, uh, that's a question from me. So the looking at uh, now more people are coming into, I understand that Bitcoin, there's limited Bitcoins in the in circulation. And then uh, when you when more countries are adopting Bitcoin as their legal tender, then it means more people will be buying. So is it possible? How is the supply going to meet up with the demand? And if that happens, is the value of Bitcoin going to come down eventually? Yes, Sanjay, you had given an answer, so maybe I'll let you start and I'll continue. Do you want to, you, you'd answer yeah. this? Uh, on that, uh, see, Bitcoin is uh, not going to increase. And in the future, I don't think that Bitcoin will be that uh, coin that you are going to use for transactions because you will find out Bitcoin is, uh, if you looked at John's uh, demand uh, curve, Within 2025, it's said to go up to 1 million US dollars, right? So uh, 
uh, that is where I feel that uh, it's not going to be Bitcoin, which is going to be your trading currency, because one day, even now, you will, somebody will laugh at you for spending even 0.1 Bitcoin, which in five years will be worth uh, millions, uh, close to about $300,000. Uh, so uh, the supply will not increase in Bitcoin. It, so uh, the cost of Bitcoin will not come down because it's not going to be uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a deflating currency. Right, uh, so that's the advantage that Bitcoin will have. But there will be, in terms of transactions, it will not be Bitcoin. There could be uh, many other coins which are coming into the market now, as you know, uh, Tether, which is a USD, but uh, there are other new coins like ADA, Polkadot, uh, which, because the market is very new. So transactional wise, it might take a few years for something to come where people will transact with, but uh, Bitcoin will not be that uh, uh, product because that will have more store value. It's like people will use it for an investment. That's where I see Bitcoin going. So Tom, I'll build on what uh, Sanjay said. You can see this price chart here. I was, this is a few days ago. It's kind of like if somebody were to transact with Bitcoin, it's kind of like I come into your shop and I buy my lunch with a gold coin, right? You're not going to do that, right? You, you might buy with a dollar. You might buy with, you know, a Naya or something else. You're not going to come into my shop and buy with a gold coin, right? Bitcoin is the same. Like as Sanjay said, it's an investment and we expect the price. You can see there's a lot of other coins that are much lower costs, like the Tether is a dollar, Cardano is a dollar, right? Somebody might transact Odua. Uh, I think, Amede, you had mentioned Odua. Do you want to mention uh, Odua really briefly here? Amede, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, Hello, can, can you hear me? Yeah, Hello, now, we can. Can you hear me? now we can, yes. Okay, I was saying that um, Odua coin is new, and um, this is actually the first um, crypto of uh bitcoin that i decided to get in, but i thought that this was a payment i thought that this was an opportunity to, as to against having to change your currencies to the dollar or to the euro or to the yen so i thought that the introduction of Udua coin into the system the crypto system for Africans by an African was the best idea that ever happened to us. As uh, Spears had said earlier about raw materials and producing, I'm involved in agri feel that the Odua coin is the beginning of a change happening in the space. And um, if people want to get into cryptos, just like you said earlier on, the best places to play are the ones that are still within the dollar in the Bitcoin now, because it's in the thousands of dollars. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll comment on the Odua. I, I like the project, uh, Bright, uh, let me see if I get his name. Uh, correct here. Bright uh, Enabulele uh, is the creator of the uh, Odua. Now, here's the thing, okay? If you think of Venezuela, I don't want their currencies, Bolivar, or something like that. Okay, it's devaluing very badly. So you have to be careful that you have to have something backing your currency. Whether we talked about before, it's your resources, whether it is Bitcoin, whether it is, you know, gold in a vault, there has to be something backing the currency. So there are two things with Odua or any Pan-African currency. One, you have to have usage. So it's what we call the network effect, right? Which is you have to have enough people using it. Like enough yes. people using it, right? And then the other thing is you have to have backing for that currency. So maybe the backing is Bitcoin. Maybe the backing is African resources. 
maybe the backing is gold, but there must be both of those things in order for that currency to have value. Okay, so that's the key. I like the currency, I support it, but I want people to be very aware, at least for the time being, it definitely is not going to be the only currency. Okay, there are going to be other currencies, even if it's just because China, I mean, China is going to use their digital yuan, right? Europe is going to use whatever their banks come up with, their central bank. America is going to use something, right? So we need to be aware of that. Now, Africa, we can certainly start moving in that direction, but we need to make sure we have some backing, you know, for our currency. And we also need to go to exchange and trade with other trade blocks, for lack of a better word. Correct. Okay, so I, I would recommend get your Odua, also get some Bitcoin, get some other, you know, currencies, hold on to those right now as this starts to play out. Because I'll tell you this, I don't think that JP Morgan or even the Chinese government knows any better than most of the rest right now how this is going to end up. Okay, so you need to kind of hedge your bets. I think somebody put that in the chat. Yes. Um, Okay, Tom, did that answer your question about the price going up? The price is almost definitely going to keep going up, though. Um, so I, I would, you know, expect the price to go up. If you want to do exchange, you could exchange in Odua. If people are taking that, you could exchange in Cardano. You could exchange in USDT. Uh, there's a lot of options for exchange. Those are a little more, you know, low cost or stable currency maybe values right now. However, um, you need to be aware that the value of Bitcoin is almost certainly in the whole market going to keep going up. And that goes to your question, I think, Yahya. Yahya, you had asked, um, how do you day-to-day -day transactions with a price going up? And like I say, I would not go and buy a sandwich with your Bitcoin. The reason they want you to buy stuff with your Bitcoin is because those companies want to take the Bitcoin off the market and put it in their treasury, okay? So do not buy your sandwich with Bitcoin. You can maybe buy it with USDC coin. You can maybe buy it with Odua. You can maybe buy it with Tether. Maybe buy it with Cardano. Okay, you can see these are cheap. Do not buy it with a $60,000 Bitcoin. Okay, does that make sense? Exactly, yes, a lot of sense. Okay, yeah, yeah. did I answer your question about how you do day-to-day -day transactions with the price going up? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I really appreciate, I mean, uh, you taking your time to come and uh, give us, I mean, uh, this, uh, I, I mean, uh, info uh, in this regard. Uh, actually, I mean, my main concern is this, that due to this, I mean, the, 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 the fluctuation that we do experience with this, I mean, uh, uh, cryptocurrency. So the, the, my, the, my, where I don't really get it is this, that, Anyway, you actually, I mean, I touched on that, I mean, uh, as to having, I mean, uh, something to back it up before we could actually use it. If, let's say you have so many, I mean, so many crypto that has, you said, let's say just now, somebody like the, the video you showed just now of uh, the, the, the lady, I mean, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, and the guy transferring money to Zimbabwe and it takes days and things like that. And that, I mean, crypto could solve this type of problem. Well, uh, if let's say someone transfer, if at, let's say I made a dual, a dual, I mean, uh, uh, crypto to another person uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, is it that so he will have to go, how will he be able to change it to? Zim, I mean, to Zimbabwe the currency, if there is no such thing there that maybe backs the, what is in Zimbabwe. So again, Zimbabwe is currently experiencing hyperinflation, right? Their currency- no, I, I'm, I, just, I just use that as an example. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the, the ease of transaction, the ease of transaction when maybe, I mean, uh, you just one transfer it, like let's say, I mean, I use the Western Union, $500 to my, I mean, uh, relative in Nigeria, and uh, they go to, I mean, the bank, and then they can't give them the equivalent in Naira. Now, if it's in crypto, if, let's say, I mean, you buy, I mean, uh, crypto coins, and the person, I mean, in Nigeria, I mean, it can be, maybe, example, you give, like, to do a choice or something, the person, the money, I mean, is immediate in Nigeria, I mean, 
But then how how does the person get back Naira to use? Yeah, so the transfer is a little harder in Nigeria now because of the new regulations, right? Um, yes, the that's bank, correct. The banks will not change it, but you can use things like local Bitcoin, which is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, so local Bitcoin, you can go on there and you can say, hey, I want to transact. I need to change to this currency. And then you can find somebody who's willing to basically do that. And the site kind of brokers it for you. So there's definitely lots of peer-to-peer -peer ways that you can change currency uh, to for your Bitcoin to fiat currency whether it be dollars or whatever Naira it might be, um, it's certainly possible to do it. Um, Anthony, you're on. I think you just got some Bitcoin. Did you? Were you able to do that? Sorry to put you on the spot, but were you able to get anything from Naira um, if you're willing to say? Anthony, are you there? Um, okay, hi, John. Hi. Uh, no, I've not. It's 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 the biggest problem. I don't know. I, I'm still okay. I tried um bin, Binance, Binance, like you said, and um they some of them they want as a this thing your social security number when you want to open an account, you know, and then if you're like a Nigerian, you're an immigrant in the US and you don't have a social security number, that becomes a problem. So um, the local Bitcoins, I registered for it, but I'm still looking for a way to transfer from Luno to an American account. It doesn't work. I'm still, I've still not found, that's why I, you know, um, I, I keep asking this question, particularly to Luno, is it that they are not working on a new way, you know, apart from doing peer-to-peer -peer because you get bonds when you do peer-to-peer, -peer, like you just suggested, peer-to-peer -peer, um, sales. Yeah, he, Luno, for instance, has certain figures for the currency that they used to deposit into Nigerian accounts. But when you try to do peer-to-peer, -peer, they do other exchange rates different from what Luno is giving you on its platform. And you, in quotes, lose money. So the question I'm asking is, if you're going to, why would I be losing maybe as much as a, a third of my value when Luno auto normally would give me that same amount? But because I'm selling to some other person now, I'm losing a third of the amount I I have uh, that Luno even shows me. So I think this is a big challenge then, Anthony, in terms of, I mean, what you can see on the screen right now, hopefully everybody can see this. I, I feel that it was much easier when Nigerian banks could handle cryptocurrencies. Yes. Uh, I really, my, my opinion personally, I really do hope they reverse this. I think this is bad for Nigerian fintech, right? Um, yeah. Or at least find a way to manage it in such a way that um, that it's going to be able to be supportive for both of Nigeria's economy and of you know being able to access cryptocurrencies. Um, I think it was easier a few weeks ago before they put this in place. Um, yeah. Now it is much more difficult. And again, I, I put it to the group here. You know, I think it would be very wise to find a way that we can both protect the economy and at the same time, give access to cryptocurrencies for the banks, for the institutions uh, to be able to do this, right? That, because like I say, in the US and Singapore, I can go to the bank, I can make an exchange, I can use a credit card, I can do other one, no problem, right? Very easy. Um, so this, this is a big challenge for Nigeria in particular right now. Can I, can I ask them, because I know that people are trading, people are on the Luno platform and they are also in, in my situation, like in the US, so they have other wallets. The question is, because if these people that have other wallets that are also on that Luno platform agree to trade with others in situation like me, like mine now, that would make it seamless because we are on the same platform. So we will get the same values 
And this person, because he's um, he has a way of shifting this core this um, um, cryptocurrency to another wallet, it's easier for that person. Why don't we have such people, you know, coming coming out to say, okay, we have this, so we can buy your Luno at the rate that Luno is selling, and we shift to other wallets. Yeah, I, I don't use Luno personally, so I can't, I don't know if anybody else on the call does, I don't use Luno, so I can't really tell you how they, you know, how they interact with others. Um, generally speaking, if you can, you know, you want to just basically move it to a wallet where you can either exchange or you can move it operates to a country where they can have a gateway to an account that will allow you to basically go back into fiat, right? Um, Luno, I don't know very well though, so I can't answer specifically for Luno. Okay. Um, uh, can I come in, uh, John? Sorry, yes, one go minute. Ahead. Yes, this uh, gentleman. I think that um, well, when you when in, in, when central banks come out with regulations as to whether they want to allow uh, digital currency at the moment or not, or whether they need to regulate and all that. There's so many factors that comes with it. One of it is what this uh, young man is experiencing. You see, we have talked about the basics of uh, what constitute digital currency and how, I mean, no currency exists in vacuum, okay? Um, you need to have uh, a treasury. You have, need to have something backing it up, okay? And I can see why the Nigerian government is very worried because as you know, all we know is we only have the petroleum, the, uh, the crude that we're selling and the value of the crude keeps on, is very volatile at this moment. And uh, the second thing that the federal government had is this diaspora transmittances, as you can, you understand recently because of COVID-19 transmittance has been very low. And so the uh, hard currencies are not coming in. And when you add that volatility, if you add the volatility of uh, digital currency into it, then you have your citizenry losing money. Somebody uses Naira to buy Luna or Bitcoin and hoping that he can exchange it at a later date for a better price and find out that at the end of the day, because uh, there is nothing backing or they, they, they don't understand the system very well. And then you have your citizenry losing money rather than gaining. Um, of course, there could be internal transactions that, I mean, uh, I understand within Nigeria context, there are internal transactions where local players were making money by, uh, you know, selling whatever they have to another person to make money, but that does not give value until you can exchange this thing for some foreign or some uh, you know some other uh, digital currencies overseas that can accept it and so as young people we have to think very very clearly sometimes when policies are made and all that we don't understand why these things happen um, we need to be very very careful and that is why I recommend that if anything, all of us young Africans need to now think of how we can revalue our raw materials, which is the king in the in the in the third, what they call the third industrial revolution. I mean, or you can call it digital economy. In this digital economy that we are in right now, okay, the king is going to be the people who own two things those who own the raw materials and the consuming market, they are going to be the king. And if we can train our population in Africa, young people to be digi digitally, um, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, capable and be able to transact, and we have the raw materials. The, we, we, in Africa, we don't need to ship, we don't need to sell raw materials out. We don't need to sell our gold. We don't need to sell our, you know, and if we know the value and we 
create our digital currency based and, um, and, and hold it to the value of the raw material that we have. I give you an example. If tomorrow Africa can tell, if the African government or even Nigerian government can tell automobile makers all over the world uh, Toyota, for instance, and say, look, Toyota, as from next year, we're not going to allow you to import Toyota or the number of Toyota vehicles we are going to allow to be imported to Nigeria will depend on how many Nigerians engineers have been trained to service Toyota vehicle. Do you know what will happen? Toyota will rush down to Nigeria to equip your universities to train people to be able to service Toyota vehicle because your market is very important. If you go and tell Chinese tomorrow that you are not going to allow people to import one thing or the other from China unless uh, under this condition and all that, you guess what will happen? They will come, they will rush because the huge market that we have in Africa, okay, is very important to them. Now, we are not valuing what we have. We're not valuing our raw materials. We are not even valuing the market that we have. And ask me, the US today, <laughs> do you know the US has the highest level of uh, debt in the whole world? Huh? But people are basically paying America to consume. The, the people are giving money to America, borrowing American money in order to buy to consume. So that is how consumption, if you have a market that is able to consume, that is how important it is. But so as young people, can we really think out of the box and begin to educate our, you know, our people, the government and all that to revalue what we have? Otherwise, if we keep on buying foreign digital currencies and hoping that we can make money in that way, you don't know the engineering, you don't know the mathematics, the algorithm behind these things. And you know, if one day they decide to change one digit of anything, you lose it. They can. So whatever. Can I, tell me there's no such things, okay? People can tell you also. Can I 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 sorry. Were you gonna Thank comment? You. So let me stop here. Yes. 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 Um Mr. Baje, I think this you you make a good point about raw materials and all that, and I support that. But uh, where you say that we are may we are making a mistake jumping into Bitcoin, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, I think is very wrong. I think. No, I what, didn't say that. What, I, didn't, you didn't get me. I didn't say you are making a mistake. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Sorry. But but let me. Say, okay, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood you. What I would want to tell you is that the problem that happened with this cryptocurrency in on the in, on the Luno platform for people like Nigerians started when the Central Bank of Nigeria brought out this rule. Prior to that. Prior to that, I made a lot of money on Luno from keeping my current my money in cryptocurrency. But immediately that happened, they locked out how to access my funds. The central bank of Nigeria locked out that these monies were monies that I brought from Nigeria and traded. Now, the, it means that Nigerian currency is locked somewhere that cannot be used by a Nigerian. How is it helping Nigeria, please? I think this kind of intervention by the Central Bank of Nigeria, you remember the one that happened in Kenya and all that. We already, there is this one from Kenya and how the Central Bank tried to bring all these lockdowns and all that. It's very archaic, and when you're suggesting some of these things, I see that you're still looking at a system that has failed. That the the the, the system is you know the local ways of using money and looking at money. The truth for me about um, cryptocurrencies and the excitement is that people now say what money is to them. Is no longer a government telling you what money is, what is what is valuable to me and you. It's between the willing buyer and willing seller. 
you know, will the two parties in the exchange, not some government policy, not some. So I'm not sure. I I I'm not sure. I I I think cryptocurrency is the best way to go about it. You know, to democratize exactly, money. Exactly. Exactly. Africa needs to go money. to cryptocurrency. Nigeria needs to go to this technology. We cannot avoid it. I think yeah. John has made a lot of very important points about this matter. Yeah. What sorry, Doctor Bajay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let me just come in here. I let's let's try not to make it a discussion amongst them uh, two. So you raise your point, and uh, let's allow John to respond. Okay. Yeah. So I, I would not say that I'm the one who has the answer. I think it's a very valid question. I think it's a discussion that we need to have. Uh, I was very concerned. I mean, I, I think many of you may know this. I I mentioned my concern when I saw this policy. I think that Nigeria was really moving quickly ahead in the fintech area, right? Which is, which is the leading area of the economy globally right now. And when we put this from the Central Bank of Nigeria, we put this in place, we basically cut the, cut the foundation out from our fintechs. So now, you know, we're at the mercy of every other country. China is racing ahead. America is racing ahead. Europe is racing ahead. And we are just watching, right? And for me, that is very, that's, that's very dangerous for us. So I don't have the answer, but I, I do feel, I mean, look, Nigeria's SEC still views these as securities. I think we should be supporting this. We should find a way that, okay, does Nigeria need to put it in treasury? That's fine, let's do that. But let's make sure that all the young people of Nigeria, like Tony, have access to be able to build business, to be able to build wealth, Using using this new technology. Yeah, I, absolutely, John. I think uh, the CBN also made some clarification after uh, sending out uh, this uh, memo to all, all banks that indeed the essence of um, uh, sending out this memo was not to staff the fintech, uh, you know, Nigerian fintech from funds. Yeah. And we can also see, you know, recently um, in the last few days, three days or so, there's um, discussions everywhere about the sale of 17% uh, of uh, Flutterwave, making it a unicorn, one of the first in um, Africa as a whole. So it's indeed um, a testament to what the CBN has earlier mentioned that it's not stopping our FinTech from growing. But I can also understand that every every decision, major strategic decision like this will have its downside. And I'm sure that they would have reviewed both the up and downside and then decided to you know, go this route. Um, as I mean, I, I still also agree with you that uh, if we see that the impact is much more than probably they would have thought, uh, that message has to go to the CBN. And how will it go? It's from discussions like this, and then, you know, putting up, um, yeah, articles in the papers, showing by data that indeed it is strangulating our fintech industry. And with that, I'm sure that uh, some review will be done. So that's really my take. I, the part I'm really interested in is how will the farmers you know, get you know the funds so through this blockchain so what you showed earlier um how can diaspora invest in this and you you, you mentioned that there are people who are you know the arms and legs in the in the whole uh, chain where they try to con confirm that indeed what whatever this farmer is saying, the, the, the crop he said he has is, is, is for real. The land is indeed available. And all these people will have to be paid. You have all these uh, platforms through, through which the money crosses, either through Bitcoin and eventually gets into Ghana cities in the po you know, pockets of the farmer. And eventually it goes back through Bitcoin to whatever currency, eventually the guy wants to hold his um, capital or his investment and uh, interest in. All these will have to, you have to pay. For every transaction, there is some payment, you know? So how much of this 
you know, goes, how much of this money goes through the, um, is lost through some of the, all these interfaces? And what kind of guarantee do you have or is available that this farmer upon, you know, uh, going through the cycle will pay this money back to the investor? Yeah, so going back on uh, what we're doing there, the this currently the number of intermediaries that we have, yes, um, yes, there will be replay available. Um, if, the the key here is that the current system that we have with the banking, which is a very archaic system, international banks, it takes a week to do an international funds transfer. There's like up to 15 intermediaries. All of them take a cut of the transaction. Okay. When we use a cryptocurrency, let's say a Stellar or a Cardano, uh, we have basically one intermediary. If you're doing it through our platform, we would take maybe a 2% fee, right? And it's almost immediate, the transfer of funds. Where, so now that farmer, instead of paying a 10% or 20% fee, they're paying 2%. They get the money not in weeks, but they get it in minutes, right? Um, and we've removed, which obviously is one of the big challenges, not only in Africa, but in the West, we've removed 14 intermediaries. There's, it's just basically the company that's sending it, okay? So, but for Africa, this is very good because what it means is that we can get that wealth into the hands of the farmer. Yes, we need people on the ground in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Rwanda, whatever country we're operating in, we need people on the ground who are going to verify the land is there, verify the crop or verify the factory or the mine or whatever the investment is. Yes, absolutely, you're correct. But look, think of it this way, okay? The banking system that we have now, and I mean, this is true in the West too, especially in the West, is like a 50 year old system. So the only innovations have been basically the ATM machine and the credit card, okay? In 50 years. Now think about it this way. If you were still using a videotape, a VHS, if you guys remember the VHS videotapes, okay? So if you're using a VHS videotape, that's like saying for the last 20 years, we're still using VHS videotapes to watch movies and for entertainment, which is ridiculous, right? None of you are using VHS, I hope. Nobody's still using VHS videotape. But that's where our banking industry is internationally. So I'm telling you now, America, China, Europe, they are moving, Japan, they are moving rapidly. Switzerland, they are moving rapidly to these blockchains. Now, what they're not doing is they're not telling everybody else, right? So if you're in the know, I happen to live in the West for a long time in Asia, so I know. But if you're not in the know, then you'll know that they're doing this, right? If you're not in the know, you won't know until they say, oh, Africa, here's the new system. But again, if they do that, we will be at the bottom of the new system. So this time we really, I mean, look, Nigeria has some of the smartest people in the world, in my opinion, okay? I think we should be doing everything we can to enable our young people, our FinTechs, to take advantage of this technology and come up with the absolute best solutions like what we're doing in my company, right? We're Singapore-based, US-based, but nonetheless, or what Bright is doing with Odua Coin, we want to really enable as many of our people as possible to take advantage of technology uh, because you can't have people continue to use VHS videotapes 25 years later, right? And that's what the banking system has been doing. I hope I answered your question. No, so there's the part of um, assurance that indeed this farmer is, um, it's going to pay back the money plus interest. So how does the investor get uh, that guarantee? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, that risk investment, that investment. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So in any uh, investment, I mean, there's not, not an absolute guarantee, but we guarantee by several methods. One is what we call smart contracts, which is another session. We'll probably need to do another session, right? So the code of the blockchain verifies that the fund transfer takes place, right? Based on certain milestones. I verify the ownership of the property. I verify the planting of the crop. I verify that the first movement of funds in return has taken place. So that is all in the code and that's verified that way and guaranteed that way. And then we also have somebody on the ground in Ghana, in Accra, someone on the ground in Lagos, somebody on the ground verifying the project, the paperwork, the ownership, right? So we have the human part. We also have operations in Singapore, right? So we have the human part and then we have the part that's in the blockchain in the code. 
Does that answer that question, Mary? Yep, yep. Thank you. Now, can I can I ask? Um, can I buy, as in into this blockchain? Now, I I invest say maybe point zero four um, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the auspicious blockchain, and um, I don't want it to be converted to a currency. Is is that possible? You know, so that I'm investing in auspicious this your blockchain. But my, I want my maybe Ethereum or whichever cryptocurrency to remain as is so that at any point in time, I can get back the value of my initial investment, um, the, um, what, what I used to invest in, not now let it be dependent on the dollar value or whatever. You, get, you understand where I'm coming from? I because I would prefer an autonomy of my initial investment instead of losing because uh, do I does it make sense? I think so. So let, let me see yeah. if I uh, understand the investment. There, there's two kinds of investments, right? We have investors in our company itself. Those are traditional investments. Those are you know minimum ten thousand dollars. Those are investments for equity in the company. Now, the other kind of investment is investments on the projects. Those are projects like the Nigerian, the farmers in Nigeria or Ghana, the mining project in Zambia, right? The women's projects across Africa. And by the way, the African continent, the free trade area is a really great opportunity right now because we can invest now across the continent like we couldn't do before. But at any rate, now you can either, if you're talking about investing in our company, that's, you know, please reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll give you more details about how you invest in our company, okay? But if you're talking about investing on different projects on the platform, you have a wallet. And that wallet, you can hold your currency in crypto. You can hold your currency in Bitcoin, in USDC. You can hold your, your you know, in US dollars. You can hold it in Ghanaian okay. CD or Naira. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are approaching six o'clock. I'm, I'm going to yeah. try to hold it down to maybe... Another question or so, if there are any more, uh, I think somebody asked about the Bitcoin ATMs. Eileen, if you're still on, um, there are several of those in different cities like London, Singapore. Honestly, a few years ago, I tried to find one to use. It was a little hard to actually get one that was working. Um, although maybe there are more working now. So that's where you can actually go. You can bring your, you know, your device and you can actually you know, just get Bitcoin uh, directly by putting money into that ATM or take it out. Uh, so that is an option for liquidity. I don't think there's a lot of those in Lagos right now. I could be wrong, but um, that is something that's starting to happen. Okay. Any other questions before we wrap up here? Celsius, great. Okay. Sorry, I, since there's no other question, let me just, you know, clarify this. Yeah. So you 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 responded to Anthony's question and um, clearly said, okay, if you invest in um, a cryptocurrency, uh, yes, you can actually get your return in that same currency if that's what you want to uh, uh, retain your investment in. Now, my challenge is where you know, so you are investing for one year. Yeah, so if you're investing into a farm, for example, you don't expect that by the next three days, the guy would have sold um, the crops and then uh, give you some form of return. So at least maybe that there'll be some time frame. Well, we can see how quickly the cryptocurrency uh, in, the, in, the, in the last few months has been increasing, for example, Bitcoin. So if somebody invests, let's say one Bitcoin today, okay, next year, and that's, let's say, um, uh, 54000 or $60,000 um, into a farm. By next year, that one Bitcoin could have been $120,000. Yeah. How will the farmer be able to pay back, you know, because even if it's 20%, okay, that money eventually goes into Ghana cities or Nigerian Naira or whatever, and then he invests it in his farm. 
So how will it be able to pay back 20% interest cannot be up to the 100% increase in the value of the Bitcoin that has already occurred. This is completely different from the investment that you, know, you have made. So outside that, the value of the Bitcoin has increased. So even if the guy gives you a 20% increase, it's what's coming back is gonna be 1.2 you know, of your original Bitcoin investment which is still less than the current one Bitcoin based on the uh, uh, current value of Bitcoin. So that, that's, it's still a challenge that I'm, I'm trying to understand in my mind. Okay, let me try to answer that one for you here. So currently globally, the global reserve currency today is still a dollar, right? So we, we operate in the dollar, right? So even if you are you sending Bitcoin, we, we, we mark to market in the dollar, okay? So we look, if, you're, if a project says we're raising, we don't say we're raising one Bitcoin, they're gonna say we're raising $10,000, right? And then if they get paid back, they're getting paid back in dollars. Now one day in the future, it may be that the world's reserve currency may become Bitcoin, then that's a different story. But today the world reserve currency is still the dollar. Therefore we mark to market in dollars. Clara, thanks. And then there was a question, Eves, um, is a suspicious blockchain independent or being built by another platform? So we don't build a coin. We are independent, right? We are, we are owned. We are African, African diaspora owned and operated based in Singapore and the U.S. Um, currently, and we do not build a coin. We build our own platform. So the ScanPay platform you see there is our platform, right? Um, that is built by us and our own technology people. Um, and we are not based on another blockchain, but we do move other coins. So we would move an Ethereum if somebody wanted to pay an Ethereum or somebody wanted to deposit a Bitcoin. Again, like I told Harry, we will still mark to market in dollars. Okay, answer that question, Eves. Great. Okay, so a couple of things that I want to remind everybody. I think it's a great discussion. We've recorded this. You can watch it again. Join the uh, group as well. I don't know if you have the link, Sanjay. You can put the Telegram group in there in the chat box. Um, join the Telegram group. We have chat and conversation about this. Obviously, join NIDO if you are a Nigerian and in Singapore and the region here. Please do that as well. Um, and a couple of things. I think it's very important that Africa and Nigeria take its own you know, foot forward in making its own, setting its own course, right? We don't wanna wait for everybody else to set the course for us. We already know how that works out. So we need to set our own economic course going forward. And I think blockchain offers a great opportunity. I do ask that for all of you connected to our, our leaders and uh, the central, the bank, et cetera, in Nigeria, please, please, please reconsider this. We, we need to make, you know, we need to make it available so that our FinTechs can become competitive quickly. Um, the other thing, the African continental free trade area is a great opportunity for everybody um, to be able to connect across the whole continent and the diaspora, right? For us to be able to transact with one another like the Odua coin and others and what we're doing with our auspicious blockchain platform. So please support whether it's us or others. Um, if you wanna talk directly about investment, you can contact me. Um, but please, you know, we should be making moves right now. Whoops, we should be making moves right now that allow Africa, Nigeria, and you know, the diaspora to thrive, uh, especially with blockchain and a whole new financial system coming up. This is really our opportunity. So thanks to everybody. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Harry, I'll hand it back to you if you wanted to make any final comments. Yeah, just like to thank you so much, uh, John, and um, also to you, uh, Sanjay, for this uh, wonderful time. We initially planned a 30 minutes extended um, Q&A, but we got it to an hour. Thanks so much for your time. And we look forward to you know, another session, probably um, this time around focusing more on how we can invest into uh, Nigeria and other African countries. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your great presentation. Welcome. And by the way, the Telegram group is in the chat. There. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you, Mr. John. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Thank you, John and Sanjay and everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.